the uh, zero axis Trojan, which is also uh, known as uh, Siriref, is a very popular piece of malware. Actually, we are seeing it on many instances of our users, uh, at least they're encountering it. And also, we're uh, sensing that overall it appears to be a very widespread threat. It seems to be literally on uh, millions of endpoints, uh, billions of endpoints out there. And so as a result, I thought it would be useful to talk about uh, this particular piece of malware. And in this video, what I'll do is give an introduction to it and explain what it's used for. And then in subsequent videos, I'll talk more about how it works underneath. Okay. Now I do want to point out that when, when these millions of infections do happen, they all form part of a peer-to-peer -peer botnet. And that's what makes this particular piece of malware, zero access, quite interesting. Now, first of all, let me talk a little bit about the initial the initial infection vectors, and recall that infection vectors are the mechanism by which a, a particular piece of malware will get onto a system. Uh, and here, in the case of zero access, the typical infection vectors are exploits, exploits, and also social engineering. Social engineering, and these are pretty much the standard ways in which uh, most exploits or, or most malware gets onto systems. Now, in terms of exploit infection. The most common way is through exploit kits, and examples of exploit kits include a particular kit known as Black Hole, which uh, maybe I'll do future videos on exploit kits. But really, exploit kits, if you don't already know, uh, exploit kits like Black Hole basically comprise a set of, of PHP scripts, and, and these PHP scripts basically look for or contain code to exploit vulnerabilities in common applications like web browsers and PDF readers and, and flash players and so on. And then users are exposed to these attack toolkits when they visit websites that are typically already compromised. And, and those websites might be compromised through other means like SQL injection or compromised FTP server credentials and, and so on and so forth. All right. Uh, and now the other way in which, in which uh, zero access can get onto a system is via social engineering. And here the, the mechanism involves, uh, for example, things like uh, popular applications or, or Applications that are disguised as popular applications. Typically, you know, we'll see games or maybe even game cracks. Sometimes people want to get a pirated version of a game or want to get a key generator for the game, and, and they'll download a piece of software that they think is going to provide them with capabilities to play that game, but it turns out that that piece of software is, in fact, malicious. Okay. Now, the main purpose, the main reason for zero access, it's, it's a raison d'etre, is basically to act as a downloader. Okay, it really is used for downloading additional malicious applications. And really, that's how botnets work in general. Botnets in general operate in this form of infrastructure as a service or, or malicious infrastructure as a service where they provide capabilities for other miscreants online to use that botnet infrastructure for malicious means. Now, in terms of zero access itself, the downloader basically... There are a few common payloads that are involved in the downloader, and, and these are payloads that tend to be fairly common among other botnets, and, and the, uh, the examples include uh, spam, uh, as you might imagine. Another thing that zero access is used for is click fraud, click fraud. And then finally, zero access is also used for Bitcoin mining, and, and Bitcoin mining is, is a relative newcomer uh, in terms of application, at least relative to spam and click fraud. Okay, let me talk about these in a little bit of a little bit of detail, even though you, you may already be familiar with them, but just in case you're not. Um, when, when you look at spam, spam is actually the canonical killer application for most botnets. And typically what a bot master will do is they'll effectively lease out their infrastructure to third-party spammers. And then these spammers will use bot-infected hosts to send out their spam, really with the idea being that even if the spam originating from one host is blocked, another spam sending host will come up in its place. And so it's going to be very hard to block all these different hosts because they'll all be located in, in different places. Uh, click fraud this is something that people maybe are less familiar with. But the idea behind click fraud is to generate from a bot-infected host what seem to be legitimate clicks on advertisements that are hosted on some affiliate website. So let's say you have an affiliate uh, right here, and the affiliate has some, some art, art advertisements on its website. And... If you have a bot-infected host, let's say there's a bot-infected host here, and this bot-infected host generates clicks on this website of these advertisements, these advertisements then in turn will go to uh, a third party. Let's say this is the advertiser who's you know advertising uh, 
whatever goods or service, let's say he's advertising widgets of some sort. And what in turn happens after this all takes place, ultimately, the advertiser actually pays the affiliate money for generating those click-throughs. And, and this is typically uh, done through a third party uh, known as an ad network. And the ad network actually facilitates this whole process of, of really managing the clicks and, and figuring out how much money is owed and, and paying affiliates and so on and so forth. But ultimately, if you have a bot-infected host here, and this bot-infected host is actually generating these fraudulent clicks, and these fraudulent clicks happen to look like legitimate clicks, then the affiliate will really receive a nice commission from the advertiser. So what will often happen is the, the miscreant or the, the online criminal will set up these fake affiliates, host advertisements, and then have falsely generated clicks click on these advertisements and get a commission in turn. Okay, and then the final example I do want to mention is Bitcoin mining. And as I mentioned, Bitcoin mining is a relative newcomer in the world of, of botnet applications, at least compared to spam and click fraud. Now, Bitcoins themselves, they really are a form of, of online currency. They're, they're actually unregulated online currency. And it turns out that anybody, anybody can generate Bitcoins if they're willing to invest the right level of CPU horsepower. And you do need quite a bit of CPU horsepower to be able to generate Bitcoins. And typically, most individuals are not going to be able to do that. But a bot master can actually leverage the, the collective computational power of the army of these bot infected drones that he has at his disposal to generate Bitcoins. Now, Bitcoins, it turns out, do have real world value, even though they are a form of unregulated electronic currency. There are people who are willing to pay real value, real dollars for Bitcoins, and you can actually exchange Bitcoins for other goods and services. So there is value in doing some type of Bitcoin mining using the CPU capacity of bot-infected hosts. Okay. Now for zero access Trojan to install, it does need escalated privileges, and that, that's an interesting point. Um, you know, when you have systems, let's say Windows systems that are protected by what's known as, as UAC, uh, and UAC actually uh, that stands for user account control, uh, user account control, and, and uh, uh, you probably are familiar with user account control if you are running any recent version of Windows because it's the, uh, the thing that you typically see a lot of pop-ups for. So what will often happen is when you install a new application, the user account control, you'll get a pop-up and users will have to accept or you'll get that warning and they'll have to accept that installation. Now, of course, if a user will get a warning when he's installing the zero access trojan and he doesn't know about that trojan there's a good chance that the user will completely you know get very nervous and, and they won't actually accept that warning they'll they'll discard it and the trojan won't install now, of course there are many users out there who will just ignore those warnings uh, but nonetheless i think the fact that there is a warning in place through user account control does act as some type of impediment that keeps the malware from actually getting installed all right now, in the case of zero access Trojan, that actually uses a very clever, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, a socio-technical trick for being able to install itself. And it's a trick that really relies on a combination of social engineering and, and technical ability. And what the zero access Trojan does is in addition to its regular malicious payload, let's say there's a particular system and it's, it's got a malicious payload here, uh, the zero access Trojan will, on that system, in addition to the, the malicious payload, will also install or, or drop a legitimate payload, an actual legitimate file. Let's say it'll be the, the Adobe Flash Player or something along those lines. And that file will get installed or put on the same directory. Okay, And then what it's going to basically do is it will load itself into the address space of this clean application. The malicious application will load itself into the address space of the clean application. And then it turns out that when you do this, when the UAC warning comes up, the UAC warning is going to come up and it's going to look like it's a warning for this clean application. It'll say something like, you know, flashplayer.exe is trying to install and it'll have a legitimate signer and so on. And so as a result, a typical user is going to think, you know, they're going to see this, this warning and they're going to say, oh, I know what Flash Player is and that's a legitimate application. They'll allow it to install. Uh, but in fact, what's happening is the malware itself is being embedded onto that system, okay? Because underneath, it's the, the malicious code that's running in the context of that legitimate process. Hopefully that made some sense. And what I'll do is I will stop this video right here. 
In the next video, I'll talk more about how zero access installs and a bit more about how it works.